If you've created a linear model in R, you may have seen these four graphs that appear when you plot your model. In this video, we're going to cover exactly what these graphs mean and how you can use them to interpret the validity of your model. I also have a video covering what the summary output of the regression means, and you can watch that by clicking the card in the corner. Anyway, let's get started. Our dataset is going to be the same from last time. It contains the species, weight, height, and width of different fish, and I'll put a link to it down in the description. We're going to start by loading in our two libraries, Redar and Dplyr. Redar for loading in our data and Dplyr for manipulating data and working with data frames. And we're also going to load in our fish.csv into this data frame called fishdf. We can run our code and take a look at our fishdf data frame. We see that we have the species, weight, height, and width of about 159 different fish. Now let's go back to our code and build out a linear model. We want our linear model to be able to predict the height of a given fish based on the width and the species. We'll name our model fish model. We'll call the lm function. Height is going to be our y variable. And we're going to predict it with the width and the species of the fish. And the data we're going to be using is our fishdf data frame. Now we can go ahead and create our linear model. And if we want to take a look, we just have to look at the summary and we get our output. Now, if any of this is confusing to you, I have a video explaining exactly what this output means in the context of our regression, so I'd recommend watching that first. But before we start plotting our model, let's just refresh on what assumptions we need to meet in order for us to be able to use a linear model. The first assumption is linearity. The relationship between our x and y variables should be somewhat linear. Second is homoscedasticity. This means that the variance of the residuals should be the same for any value of x. Third is independence the observations should be independent of each other. And fourth is normality. This is the assumption that the residuals are normally distributed. We'll come back to all of these in a bit, but for now we're gonna plot our model and look at the plots. So we can write plot fish model and run that code. Let's take a look at the first plot though, the residuals versus fitted values. A residual is the difference between the observed value and predicted value. So if we put that in the context of our data set, it's a difference between the actual height of the fish and our model's prediction of what the fish's height should be. So if we were able to perfectly predict the height of every fish, then the residual would be zero for every observation. However, most models aren't perfect at predicting, so there's usually gonna be a residual that'll either be positive or negative. So the residual versus fitted graph can be helpful in telling us if we're using the appropriate type of model for our data set. We're using a linear model, so we wanna make sure that there's a linear relationship between our variables. What we're looking for are the residuals to be both negative and positive, and to be randomly scattered throughout the graph with equal variability, like this. The two things we want to look out for in the graph are heteroscedasticity and a nonlinear relationship. Heteroscedasticity, the opposite of homoscedasticity, essentially means that the variability of our predictions, in this case the predictions of our heights, are not equally variable throughout. Translating that to our graph, we would have heteroscedasticity if the residuals were closer to the zero line for some values, but then further away for different values. In fact, that's exactly what we see here. The residuals are initially close to zero, but get further away as our predicted height increases. Now conceptually, this would make sense, because if we have a tiny fish with a small width, it'll likely have a small height. But as the width gets bigger and bigger, it might be hard to predict if this is a long, thin fish or a short, wide fish. Now, just because we have heteroscedasticity, it doesn't mean that width and species are bad predictors for height. It does mean, though, that we won't be able to accurately predict heights consistently and should look into adding maybe more variables into our model. Now, the other thing we want to look for in the plot is a nonlinear relationship. In that case, we'd expect to see weird patterns in our plot. For instance, we might find a clump of residuals all below zero for some fitted values, and then another clump all above zero for other fitted values. In this plot, even though we have some heteroscedasticity, there's about an equal number of residuals above and below the zero line throughout, so there's likely a linear relationship here between the height and then the width and the species. But what would this plot look like if we were instead predicting weight based on width instead of height based on width? Now, my assumption is that weight would increase a lot quicker than width because the relationship isn't linear, so let's actually create a new model and take a look. We'll create a new model called fish weight, and here we're predicting the weight of the fish based on the width of the fish. And again, the data we'll be using is our fish df data frame. And we can also call the plot command with our fish weight linear model and run the code. 
Now, if we look at the residuals versus fitted graph, we definitely see some weirdness in our plot. First of all, all the residuals have low variability for the small weights, but pretty high variability for the larger weights. So we already know that there's some heteroscedasticity here. Another thing we see are a lot of positive residuals for the lower weights, negative residuals around the middle, and then huge positive outliers towards the large weights. Conceptually, this would mean that we're predicting very low, actually negative weights for the smaller fish, and then predicting weights that are too large for the medium-sized fish, and then we're just really bad at predicting weights for the big fish because there's a lot more variability. So we can definitely assume that the relationship between weight and width here is non-linear, or else the residuals would be more equally above and below the zero line. So now we're going to move on to our normal QQ plot, or the quantile-quantile plot. And we're going back to our initial linear model, which was predicting height based on width and species of our fish. So as I mentioned before, one of the assumptions of linear models is that the residuals should be normally distributed. This normal QQ plot can actually show us if those residuals are normally distributed by comparing them with an actual normal distribution. If we think of the classic bell curve normal distribution where the mean is zero, we'd expect the distribution to look something like this. About 70% of the data would be within one standard deviation of zero, and about 95% of the data would be within two standard deviation away from zero. In fact, if we look at the x-axis, which is labeled as theoretical quantities, we see that there's a lot of data points clustered in the center, with most data being between negative two and two, and just a few extremes on the end. This is because the data points are actually normally distributed in relation to the x-axis. Now let's take a look at the y-axis, or the standardized residuals. We're still talking about the same residuals as last time, the observed heights minus the predicted heights, and just like the x-axis, we've standardized all those residuals by centering the mean on zero, and each unit represents one standard deviation. So if these residuals were perfectly normally distributed, we'd expect the points to be straight and follow that dashed line, since we know that the points are already normally distributed along the x-axis. Instead, what we see are outliers on both sides of our dataset. We'd expect 95% of the data to lie within two standard deviation away from the mean, but we see a lot of data points below the negative two line and above the two line. So this means that our data set likely has a lot of extreme values and that there are a relatively large number of extremely short and extremely long fish. So it's a little difficult to predict what the heights are gonna be just based off of this model. So our plot actually also labeled some of these data points that are outliers like number five and number 30 up here. So what I wanna do is actually create a new table and compare these predicted heights with the actual heights and see why the numbers are so off. So I'll create a new table called fish predictions that's gonna use that fish DF data frame. And we're gonna add a new column called predictions. We're gonna call the predict command and pass in our fish model. And then we're gonna tell it that the new data is gonna be fish DF, which is essentially our original data source. So all it's doing is creating a new column with the predictions and appending that to the original fish DF data frame. We can go ahead and run this and take a look at fish predictions. So if we take a look at our data frame and we look at observation number five, here we're predicting that the height is gonna be 14.7. In reality, it's 12.4. And it seems like the reason we're predicting such a high height is that the width and the weight are relatively high compared to what some of these other fish are. Similarly, if we go to observation 30, we're predicting that the height is about 17.1 based on our weight and our width, but in reality, the height is 18.95. So we're massively under predicting here. And that's the reason that the residuals are so extreme in this situation. So now we're gonna take a look at our third plot, the scale location plot, which is also called the spread location plot. And this shows us if the residuals are spread equally among our predictions, so we can check the assumption of homoscedasticity or equal variance of the residuals. We've got the fitted values on the x-axis similar to our first plot, but the square root of the absolute value of the standardized residuals on the y-axis. If we want equal variance in our residuals, we'd want the dots to be pretty evenly scattered throughout the whole graph and show no pattern. And we want our red line to be relatively horizontal. We already determined from our first plot that the model violates the assumption of homoscedasticity since the variance of the predictions are larger for longer fish, and we can pretty clearly see that the y values tend to increase the larger that the fitted values become, and the red line reflects that with this slight upward trend. So as you probably have figured by now, there's definitely some overlap in information between the plots, 
So you may not be checking all four plots when doing an analysis of your model, but it certainly helps to know what each plot is trying to show. And the last plot we're going to look at is the residuals versus leverage plot. This plot helps us find influential data points, if any. Because our linear regression works by minimizing the total error over all observations, if we include data points that lie way outside the rest of our data, they could actually have a pretty big impact on our model. Another way to put it is that the data point may not follow the general trend, and if we include it, our model might drastically change just to minimize that one data point's residual. So looking at this plot, we have leverage on the x-axis and standardized residuals on the y-axis. Leverage essentially means how much influence does the data point have on the model. Instead of trying to find a pattern, we're actually now just looking for values in the upper right or lower right corners. These would represent points that have a lot of leverage, so very influential on our model, but also have large residuals, so they're pretty far off from our estimate. Specifically, we want to see if there are any points that lie outside the dashed red line Cook's distance, meaning they have a high Cook's distance score. So if we had data points that were like this and we removed them from our model, they would likely have a big impact on the coefficients and the intercept of the model. But in this case, we don't really have any influential outliers that we need to remove. But what I'm going to do is manually modify our FishDF data frame and show you what it looks like when we have an outlier that we probably should remove from our model. So I'm going to set our first observation's height to 100. So I've set the height of the first observation to 100. I'm also going to recreate our fish linear model and then plot the model. And I can run all this code. And now we see this data point, observation 1, that lies outside our Cook's distance line. So we might want to remove it from our model if we were to see this in our data. So now we have a pretty good understanding of the four plots that are part of the linear regression, along with the summary output. I'm going to add some additional resources in the description if you're interested in learning more. But thanks for watching the video, and I'll catch you in the next one.